Open heart, open mind. Welcome to the Sadba channel, the official platform of the Sadba project, uh, developing openness and embracing diversity. I'm uh, Sherap Wong, the co-founder of the Sadba project. And myself, Samisha Kamle. I'm from Satwa Youth, uh, bringing dharma to you, bridging dharma with youth. Satwa Youth is also a program which is initiated by Satwa Project. Thank you. So today, uh, before we start our program today, first of all, I would like to uh, express our thankfulness and uh, gratitude to our streaming partner and media sponsor, uh, Duran ASEAN and Duran mm -hmm. FM. Not to forget also a very important man behind the scene, our broadcast director, Brother Chong. Brother Chong, would like to say hi to our audience. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us. For those of you who have just joined us, please do like and share our post so that more can benefit. And for those on YouTube, watching on YouTube also, please like, share, and subscribe. And now back to you guys. Thank you, Brother Chong. So today okay. we are going to, um, yeah. Okay. yeah. So today we are going to have a new series in uh, the series entitled Noble Tara series. So our topic for today's discussion is Sisters of Dharma, part one. So let us introduce to you our moderator today. Our moderator today will be Sister Smita Lahiri. Having spent over 20 years in the technology industry, Smita decided to give it up and dedicate more time to her Dharma journey. After finding some precious teachers and attending several retreats, she decided to undertake a structured uh, study of Dharma. She recently graduated with a diploma in Buddhist philosophy from Nalanda tradition from Tibet House, Delhi. She is currently on the board of Tashi Gasseling Buddhist Center in Maine and works closely with Marabha Dassel. During her corporate tenure, she was on the advisory board for the Grace Hopper Conference for Women in Technology and worked passionately for the cause. She was a counselor for cancer patients and their caregivers, something that helped her immensely in her Dharma practice. Smita is based in Bangalore, India. Welcome, Sister Smita. Thank you so much, Sharabla. Thank you, Samiksha, for having me. And thank you to Sattva for uh, having me uh, moderate this discussion. And uh, thanks to all of those who are behind the scenes making this happen. Look forward to a very fruitful conversation today. So our first contributor is Venerable Tenzin Basil. Venerable Tenzin Basil is a teacher and leader who has been practicing Buddhism and meditation for over two decades. She is the founder of Main Mindfulness Project and serves as the Buddhist spiritual advisor at Bates College and the spiritual program coordinator at Tashi Gatsaling Buddhist Center. She holds many honor and distinctions for her work within women, children, and youth throughout the US, India, and the world. A warm welcome to you, Venerable Dasil, to this program. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Shamiksa, and thank you, Brother Sherab Wong. Thank you, Brother Chong, behind the scenes, and to Sister Sumita, thank you for your skillful preparation and moderation of this wonderful opportunity to share. Uh, very um, happy for the opportunity, and thank you to all at Sattva for providing that. And our next contributor will be Bikuni Vandana. Bikuni Vandana uh, is from Gujarat and now studying in Nagpur, Maharashtra. She's doing a BA. Uh, for a second year in Pali. She was ordinated, she was ordained as Bhikkhuni in 2019, and she now lives in Nagpur, Maharashtra, to pursue her higher studies and Dharma practices. She vows to work for the welfare of Buddhist women and is fully committed in striving for a better and brighter future for Bhikkhuni Sangha and female empowerment. Welcome, Bhikkhuni Vandana. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shara uh, Wong, brother. Uh, thank you, Samiksha, and uh, thank you, uh, Brother Chong, for inviting me here again. Uh, I think uh, 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 I would like to represent the Pekunis Sangha from India because uh, uh, no one uh, speaks about Indian Pekunis. So once again, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you. So our next contributor is Nivedita Chali. Chali. Uh, Nivedita is the founder of ARTH, a mental health initiative that offers counseling and arts-based therapy services for people dealing with mental health issues. 
Her academic and professional training across over 25 years has focused on alleviating suffering through compassionate action. She is a trained occupational therapist from KEM Hospital and a psychiatric social worker with a doctorate from the Tata Institute of Social Science, Mumbai, where she also served as faculty. She has provided care in diverse mental health settings, ranging from hospitals to rehabilitation centers, and has worked in crisis areas such as suicide prevention and disaster relief post earthquakes and tsunamis. She has been actively involved in relief efforts during the pandemic with JSA uh, in resources mobilization, creation for creation of a helpline and training workshops. She facilitated two courses on applied Buddhist psychology in Mumbai and Chennai in partnership with BALM with an aim of bringing wisdom and compassion to our daily lives. She began studying Buddhism during her training with the WCC Foundation Pune with, a, with Asha Pillai Balsara and continues to pursue her studies in Buddhist philosophy from Tibet House, New Delhi with Venerable Geshe Doji Damdur. Oh, we extend a warm welcome to you, Sister Nivedita. Very happy to have you on this program. Thank you for joining us. You're, you're muted, uh, Sister Nivedita. Yeah. Better now? Yes, can hear you. Okay. So very grateful to be here and uh, special gratitude to the Sattva team, all those who are visible here as well as those who are backstage. Um, because, you know, to be able to send this message across requires so much of effort and work. And all of the back scenes um, that Smita has also been helping with moderation and preparation. Very, very grateful. Um, thanks to all the audience. And most importantly, uh, grateful to all of our teachers because of whom we are really here today. Uh, and I hope this can be of benefit. I think we have got all our speakers, so we hand over this program to Sister Smita. Thank you so much, Samiksha. So good evening, everybody. Good evening to our panelists and good evening to our uh, audience listening today on YouTube and Facebook. Um, I think we are all here on a common quest of, you know, walking the spiritual path. And anyone who has been on a spiritual path knows that it's a lot of work we do for ourselves, on ourselves, our minds, our quest for knowledge, wisdom. Um, however, along this journey, you know, the importance of a supportive Sangha is very key to our practice, right? Uh, a good community, a good supportive, uh, you know, fellow travelers are always needed to help us along this journey, to help us resist the, you know, the unwholesome ways of, of our time. And it's even more challenging today, given all the, all the stuff that goes around. So while we need a supportive Sangha to um, go along on our journey, there are a lot of challenges um, and a lot of you know, struggles that we encounter and that could be different for the lay population and the, uh, you know, the nun population or the monk population. So really, um, Shirabla and I thought that, you know, we really would like to guide our audience. We like to share some of our personal stories and, you know, help them uh, find ways on how they could take on and find their uh, Sangha or their Dharma brothers and sisters um, in various ways or various avenues, right? So I'll start today's uh, conversation with um, the first question to Venerable Dessel. And, you know, let's start with the definition of a Sangha first. What did Buddha mean when he referred to Sangha in the refuge prayer? And what has it translated to in today's practice of Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, thank you and hello to everybody who's joining in and thank you for sharing this precious time uh, with us on this exploration. Um, you know, it's hard to say exactly, of course, I can't speak for Buddha, but let's come to say what historically this term has meant within the tradition of Buddhism. The Sangha, um, is said to be a community of dedicated practitioners. A sangha is a, a community of like-minded 
um, people who have joined together, especially using it in the sense of a spiritual community, a sacred community that's gathered up for a unique and single pointed purpose. In Buddhism, the purpose is to attain enlightenment by following the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. Um, and so Sangha is a term that uh, actually predates Buddhism. It's from Sanskrit. And so you can talk about sacred communities of Sangha that had gathered in Jainism that was active at the time of Buddha. And prior to that, Sangha's um, com sacred communities that would have been living together under other kinds of teachers. But in the sense of the term of the Buddha using it, the story that I was told by Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo was that even after the Buddha attained enlightenment, Mara kind of came to him and after he attained his great awakening said, okay, yes, you, you, now you've attained, so you're finished. You know, you, congratulations, I couldn't stop you. So Mara is kind of the ruler of the material temptation world that creates samsara driven by ignorance, driven by selfish desire, greed, attachment, driven by hatred and aversion. And so the Buddha overcame all of these things, as well as jealousy, pride, resentment, many, many um, ignorances, and he attained awakening. And then Mara said, yes, okay, I couldn't stop you. So you did it, and you weren't the first, and you won't be the last, and it's really hard to do. So good for you. Now go ahead and enter into nirvana. And Buddha said, no, you know, that's, I'm not going to enter into nirvana until I establish the fourfold sangha. And I'm going to establish the fourfold Sangha to be able to hold my teachings of Dharma because it's actually the teachings themselves that will lead the future practitioners to enlightenment. Of course, the Buddha of this time, Shakyamuni Buddha, lived almost 2,600 years ago. And knowing that his physical form would not last that long, he wanted to, he wanted to preserve the teachings, the, the be beauty and purity of the teachings within a tradition that would then share them in a certain amount of time. He also said they won't last forever. So that it's a very limited amount of time that the teachings can be held and continue to live and benefit beings on this particular age. But this, for this reason, he created the fourfold Sangha. And even during his lifetime, he gathered bhikkhus. So the first ordained men were called bhikkhus, the monks. Eventually, his stepmother, who helped raise him, his wife, and a bunch of noble ladies from court came and also requested, please ordain us, please ordain us, because they were so persistent. At first, he says no, but they were so persistent. And his attendant, his cousin Ananda said, you know, can women not attain enlightenment? The Buddha said, yes, of course they can. And he said, then why won't you ordain them? And he, then Buddha said, okay, we'll, we'll create bhikkhunis. They will be the ordained sangha, the male bhikkhus and the female bhikkhunis. And then he was also at the time giving teachings to the nobility, to kings and queens, to lay people, to anyone who came to him with interest. Sometimes rich landladies who had, had property, sometimes poor street sweepers. But he didn't discriminate on gender or caste or background. And anyone who came to him and said, I too would like to... to follow the teachings, if they didn't have the causes and conditions to, to be able to take ordination, they were able to become what are called lay people. And so he also said lay men and lay women, this fourfold Sangha, will be the, the practitioners that uphold the teachings. Now some of the Sangha are going to attain enlightenment and they will be a Sangha that's transcended. So the Arahants who are the Arya beings who have already gained that liberation and enlightenment, who then continue to hold the teachings for the benefit of beings who have the karma and the interest to practice the Dharma purely. So that's a kind of traditional story of how the Sangha was established um, from within the tradition. And a lot in the Vinaya, if people are interested, you can read much more within the rule basket of the Tripitaka, the Vinaya section really lays out the rules and guidelines of the ordained Sangha. And then as well, why the ordained Sangha depends like pillars on the other two of the or of lay Sangha is because that's traditionally how the ordained Sangha would get material support. So a simple room, like here I'm living and staying with a friend, another place being given a room over my head, a room to stay in, some simple food to have, and 
you know, that the lay people work hand in hand. And then the ordained Sangha gives their full-time dedication to their practices, to the teachings, to study, to really understand them, and then to be able to be a source of that. Because as we know, lay people don't have as much time to commit to all of the practices, but that's kind of the job of the ordained Sanghas 24-7. As Jetsuma says, bodhisattvas never take a day off. Thank you so much, Venerable Desel, for uh, opening the conversation with that. Uh, Bhikkhuni Vandana, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on what uh, uh, Vinaya says? And uh, are there any differences in the Sangha and the tradition today, uh, the tradition that you're representing, Theravada? How have you seen it evolve and transform from then to now? Uh, yeah, like, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting here. And... Uh, it's a, uh, what uh, uh, Tan Dalsil, when people say it, it's very informative. Uh, yes, I would like to say uh, it's a very like change because like Buddha said, everything uh, will change with times, right? So the importance of Sangha cannot be uh, overestimated trying to achieve enlightenment by yourself and uh, only for yourself. It's like uh, trying to walk uphill during a uh, mudslide, opening yourself to others. Uh, supporting and being supported is uh, critical to uh, crossing the uh, features of ego and selfishness, especially in the West people. I was giving like a small example, like, uh, especially in West like, people who come to Buddhism uh, very often, uh, uh, do so because they are hurt and confused. So they go to a dharma center or monastery and find other people who are hurt. And uh, confused oddly, this seems to anger. Some people, they want to be the only ones who hurt anyone, uh, everyone else, and supposed to be cool uh, and pain-free and supportive. So in the Sangha, is the community of people uh, who perfect, uh, who have the perfect right to cut through your trips and uh, feed you with their wisdom, as well as the perfect right to demonstrate uh, their own neurosis and be seen through by you. Uh, the companionship with the Sangha is kind of clean friendship, right? Uh, without expectation, without demand, uh, without demand. And but the same time fulfilling. So uh, when is Buddha's time? There was uh, that that time we don't have to uh, struggle that much because people were not un, uh, people were uneducated and uh, they they listen because it's uh, new for them. And nowadays, like that, people are not listening and uh, they are not uh, like um, cooperating with the sangha. Like a uh, uh, venerable Dasil said that there is a four four pillars. Bhikkhu, uh, Bhikkhuni, Upasak, and Upasika, right? Lay person, lay Sangha, and ordained Sangha, monastic Sangha. So, uh, monastic Sanghas are ready to cooperate because they are learning, because they are teacher, and they have uh, very strong uh, responsibility to spread the Dhamma. But lay people, they are not uh, 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 supporting, they are not ready to learn. They are always like, no, we are well educated, we don't have to learn, we don't have time. So, uh, this kind of thing you will see in India. So I think uh, it's uh, different. Uh, it's uh, lots of things change uh, since the past time and this time. So I think uh, lay people should support to a monastic Sangha, uh, Bhikkhu Sangha and Bhikkhuni Sangha to spread the Tamma. That's all. Thank you so much, Bhikkhuni, uh, for pointing that out. And, you know, it's very important for us, Lays, uh, the Lay Sangha, to be, you know, supportive of the um, Bhikkhuni Sangha. And um, uh, also for pointing out that, you know, the Sangha plays a very important role in us overcoming our own ego and selfishness, right? And, uh, um, you know, it's a community that feeds you with wisdom. So, wisdom. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for uh, bringing those very valuable aspects of the Sangha. Uh, I'll move on to uh, Niveta Daji right now. Uh, as a lay practitioner, what does the Sangha mean to you? And what is the 
what is the shape and form it's taken for you in your journey? So first of all, uh, thank you to Sunmat Dasella as well as Bikuni Vandana for sharing because I think one is having that broad perspective of understanding the fourfold nature of the Sangha. Um, and like Bikuni Vandana shared, there is also a certain kind of interdependence between these four, you know. Um, and there is a need for therefore looking at support, not just within our Sangha, but really within this larger space. Um, in terms of how it affects, I think, as lay people, there is, of course, a divide. And I feel, um, you know, it takes perhaps a lot of merit to be able to also engage and meet with teachers and meet, meet with communities which can help and guide us. Um, but I think, you know, several of us have been really fortunate. Um, and in some ways, while the pandemic has actually brought some amount of lot of chaos and losses, there's also been a certain kindness of the teachers where they've all come online and therefore also all of us who in some way cling on to the tales of our teachers, you know, coattails of our teachers, we've all made our way online. So I feel uh, there's so much benefit uh, that can come from these spaces. And um, a lot of the traits that Bikuni Vandana was talking about, where there is support, where there is learning, um, you know, I feel we still manage to achieve that in smaller pockets, perhaps. We don't have necessarily access to larger communities. But when I think of the Sangha today, for me as a layperson, um, it's a group of people who are willing to, in some way, shift away from the mainstream tide, which pushes you with certain trends and patterns of individualism, perhaps, consumerism, perhaps. Uh, and this becomes a group of people who are willing to say, but what's going on inside of me? How is it that I see the world? Um, is there something I can do to declutter perhaps? And that kind of courage and that kind of space, which is um, compassionate holding for each other. Having said that, it's definitely not utopia and perfect because all of us are in some ways flawed and bringing our own baggage in like um, it was mentioned by the earlier speakers but yet using this space to help each other through that and recognizing that conversations flow differently because everybody is also um, trying their best to bring these tools back to their daily life so i think um, there's some amount of yes and some amount of no and um, I feel there's also a lot of um, dependence on the monastic communities because uh, they're holding on to these teachings and they're able to bring it to us in a manner which is more and more applicable, which I think is fabulous. So. Thank you so much, Nivedita Ji. I think, you know, you uh, really painted the picture very well. I think, you know, trying to find that small space or that set of people who are willing to shift away from the mainstream and you know individualism and consumerism and uh, who kind of provide you that space of that fellow uh, travelers uh, but also highlighting the fact that we too depend on the monastic community so i think it's very well established that there is an interdependence of uh, you know the monastic and the lay community and that stands uh, true even today right uh, so I'll come to Venerable Dessel, uh, you know, what is your personal, you've been practicing for over 20 years. So from when you started, what is your personal experience been of, uh, you know, having a Sangha? Have you had a constant set of Dharma uh, sisters and brothers who are with you through this journey or how did that evolve? Uh, if you could share some of your personal stories. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Smitoji, for that question. Um, Yes, 20 years ago, almost now to this state in, in Maine, I moved back to Maine, which is on the east coast, northeast of the mainland of the United States. I had been living for two years in Hawaii on the Big Island, and there's a small Buddhist temple on the Big Island where His Holiness the Dalai Lama has visited many times. And when I first arrived there, I only knew two people, but they said, oh, really, you need to go down and visit this temple. I wasn't a nun at the time. I wasn't even a Buddhist. But... I did go and stay at this temple, and in the morning um, there was a chant master, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, 
and he would lead the morning prayers and there are only about three or four of us there it's a small very small space and he after the first morning said oh please stay and have tea with me and we began to talk a little bit so this was like really my first deep connection to uh, Tibetan Vajrayana Sangha and he was just really so kind and wonderful and very quickly when I moved back to Maine um, I met my teacher uh, the, His Eminence Kensor Rinpoche Lopsang Sitenle, who at the time was still called um, Geshe-la. He had just finished his Geshe degree. He had been asked to become a Kenpo, which is an abbot at a big monastery in South India of Tashi Limpo. But he had he had told His Holiness the Dalai Lama, please, I just tried to start a school up in Ladakh. So, and I, my, one of my first questions to him was, how do you say no to His Holiness? He said, well, he knew I was doing my best and he had been coming and staying and living in the US to finish his Geisha degree. So he's from Northern India, Ladakh. And so even meeting him as a Sangha who was by himself here in the United States, kind of going to a few different small centers in Maine there were no centers actually. He was just giving talks in bookstores, sh- book at colleges, the main college of art, um, at Bates College. You know, he didn't really have any kind of center when he first started. And then he was living with a friend who had an art studio and he said, oh, this will be a good enough teaching studio. We'll at least be able to get 10 to 20 people in here. And so that's really where we started was just in this very simple artist studio in Freeport, Maine. Um, but once I met him, I was a graduate student at the seminary where he was a guest teacher. And I really thought how amazing that he's just traveling around sharing his beauty and his light, his wisdom and compassion, joy, loving, pure loving kindness. As Bhikkhuni said, no expectation, no charge, no, no asking for anything. And I thought, I want to know what he knows. So I was obviously, I wasn't even a lay person when I met him. I was just a person as everyone is just a person looking for more joy, more wisdom, more sustenance. Yes, maybe some suffering was there and still healing because we're all, as long as we're still in samsara, looking to become free of all suffering. And so very quickly we connected and I thought, well, I really want to listen to more and learn what he's teaching um, and so we started a small group of lay people, and it was mostly women. It was probably 90% women and 10% men. So we called ourselves initially the Dharma Sisters, who then started to form community and organize and prepare for his teachings and his visits. And then we got a big, bigger, more people coming. We got another place to hold more people because more people were coming for his talks. And then even more people. So then someone sponsored a place in the Dharma. The eight Dharma sisters ran everything from the programming, inviting teachers. We expanded to remade tradition. We invited other teachers from the Kagyupa. We're more Gelukpa. But we said, as long as they're bona fide teachers in the Dharma, um, especially monastics, we invited Venerable Rabina to come. We wanted female teachers, Lama Willa, from the Kagyupa tradition, um, to come and share, and we we were able to hold a space to, in a place to bring even more traditions from within Maine to join together in a bigger way. This all happened from about 2006 till about 2012, 2013, and then it became more difficult. People didn't have as much time. The funding was wasn't really there. And during that time period, I myself started to get the inspiration and aspiration to ordain because I saw how precious the Dharma is. And if we don't have Sangha to keep that as their number one priority to to try to create a space for it, to keep the resources available. We had a beautiful lending library that people could borrow for free and sign out the books and bring them back, video materials. So many resources, um, which now, as as Bhikkhuni mentioned, Vadana, I really appreciate you saying that as education is coming and people get educated and can read and think for themselves, yes, they can understand Dharma more, but not to the depth of ordained Sangha. That's a whole different vow, a whole different level of commitment. Just like if someone gets married to one person, they can't say, oh, well, this marriage is okay, but I think I'll take a few girlfriends on the side. It's like, you're just in that one thing, you know, it's a seriously whole different commitment. So People in the West, especially now, saying that there's no real role anymore for the Sangha, and especially even with Vajrayana, like, oh, it's a secret practice, and we don't need ordained monastics because they can't truly practice the highest yoga tantra. That They don't really know what they're talking about. There's a whole different way 
that the ordained Vajrayana Sangha does practice very high levels of Vajrayana Buddhism. Having lived with the nuns at Jetsuma Tenzin Palma's uh, nunnery for almost three years, those are some of the highest level practitioners I've ever been with. And also some Vajrayana monks up in Ladakh at the Nari Institute of Buddhist Dialectics. I mean, we can't say that there's no need anymore for the ordained monastic sangha in, in any of our traditions, Vajrayana, Mahayana, or Theravada, they all serve a purpose. The Buddha would have agreed with that, seeing with his wisdom, teaching in 84,000 different ways that the sangha, ordained sangha, is critical. In fact, he said, if any of the fourfold sangha disappears, it's a sign that the Dharma itself is in a degenerate age because you need them like four pillars to uphold the foundation of a building. So my Dharma sisters and brothers have come in lay form in Upasika Upasaka, as, as that means lay practitioner, um, male, female, and as well as Dharma brother sisters of the monks, of the robes and the nuns. And I don't call <laughs> nuns monks as in the West often people do because it's okay to value that women and have a different kind of nuns, have a different energy that we bring to the Dharma. Even the monk brothers who live nearby to Tashi Jong, to, to Donju Getzling, they love to come to the nunnery because it's a whole different vibration. There's a joy there. There's a different essence. Just like we love to go to the monastery when they're going to do a heavy big puja and the Lama dances, we appreciate that they're doing a whole different vibration and energy with their essence as monks. But we don't need to try to get rid of that at all. We don't need to mm -hmm. try to merge that into something else. We can definitely hold and appreciate what's similar. The goal is the same for all four. The goal is to practice the Dharma all the way up to enlightenment. Lay people can also attain. But we need to value and appreciate that it's actually the ordained Sangha that studies, that learns, that we have teachers who, as Sister said, showed up during the crisis during COVID who are available online. That's very different if one imagines just lay people trying to show up on Zoom and, and talk to each other and give teachings to each mm -hmm. other. It wouldn't have had the same impact. So Dharma yeah. sisters and brothers definitely huge, always will be part of that journey as the dependent arising. This is the true selfless nature. Buddha was talking about the shunyata, that we need each other, we depend upon each other to bring the flourishing of the whole flourishing and, and to fruition the whole Dharma practice. Thank you, Tasilla, for sharing your story. Enough, I can't say enough in gratitude to my Dharma sisters and brothers. And I, I bring the brothers in because they also, one summer I lived three months as the only nun with the brother monks up at the Nari Institute. Uh, I can't discriminate. I don't love one set more than the other. But of course, living within the, the sisters at the nunnery, you're living so as one that you, you feel, you know, that that's a much more familiar community because you're part of yeah. that. Sister. But the Absolutely. I think this entire conversation, though we have titled yes. it Sisters in Dharma, I, I think, I you appreciate know, it. I just want yeah, to give a little... Little shout out to the brothers because sometimes yeah. that duality and division these days there's a little bit of rat, 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 rat tension. I don't want that one, I want harmony. Yeah, I think we are inclusive, and you know, when we are talking about uh, the Sangha here, we are inclusive, of yes, yes, Dharma yes, brothers yes. and sisters. Yes. Um, so coming to uh, Nivedita Ji, uh, you mentioned that you know, you did find the set of people, like minded people, who you thought were your Sangha. So tell us your Sangha story. Have you had some constant companions along the way or you had some challenges? Uh, did you find yourself alone at times? No matter how smart my devices get, I can't say the same about my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I continue to speak while I'm muted. But, um, anyway. So first of all, just very grateful, Sunmada Sala, for your story because um, I moved to Dubai and there are multiple days where I walk around saying, hmm, where's my physical Sangha? You know? um, so it's so while I was listening to that story, I also felt a great amount of hope. So thank you. Um, 
but at the same time, I recognize how, frankly, the biggest block is really my own patterns. So there was this one day where I'm walking around feeling a little sorry for myself, saying, oh, here I am so far away. <laughs> and then there is this, I'm crossing this beautiful house. And on the side of the house, there's this lovely water cooler, you know, and here we are, it's the desert. So it's really hot. And there is this water cooler that these homeowners have very kindly provided to every single passerby. Um, and then I started begin begun to realize that, you know, even when I approach something as my sangha, you know, those boundaries that we see, a certain kind of way in which we're perceiving can become a bigger block. Um, and you can look at it as traits, traits of kindness, traits of compassion, um, which makes it perhaps um, a lot more easier than to have that open mind and open heart that we started this session with and to be able to find people who are perhaps like-minded who are saying within well you know not necessarily lay people but just really people saying who want to kind of not only flow in a certain kind of mainstream trend but are willing to say hey you know what it's not just hot for me, it's really hot for the world. And I'm not the only one who needs water. Everyone needs water. And even in that action, that there is so much of courage and compassion and kindness and thinking of the other, that you kind of hold on to these spaces and these people and these moments as well. So my understanding of Sangha is perhaps becoming broader and looser at the same time, but a little bit perhaps more inclusive, I hope. But having said that, I'm also very, very uh, fortunate because, again, I feel as kindness of the teachers because when the teacher manifests and all of us flock around, you also realize, ha, huh, people, you know, and there is a holding there which happens and it becomes in some way um, extra tight. I don't know how else to put it, because not only are you trying to follow a path, but you're also in some way learning from the same teacher, which also binds you. So even if you go to them with the same mundane, petty issues that, you know, we our life keeps throwing up, you uh, have a sense of how different that conversation can be because it doesn't follow the same path. Uh, and in that, there's a certain kind of holding and a certain kind of mirror which comes back to you and you're like, oh, yeah, okay. I can see all of this lovely clinging which keeps kicking in. So, so the biggest obstacle, I would say, is pretty much here, <laughs> the patterns of our own mind. Um, otherwise, I feel when you approach with an open heart and open mind, I feel the Sangha is really right there. And um, I feel very grateful for our virtual worlds, of course, because like this conversation as well, across genders, across spaces, across places, um, we're able to kind of connect and speak and bond and push and nudge and guide and do all the things needed to get us to move a little bit. Yep. Thank you so much. I think that was, uh, you know, very uh, heartful sharing from you. Um, I like that thing you said, when the teacher manifests, the people flock around. I think, you know, like for for us students of Keshe, uh, Durji, uh, Durji uh, it's kind of, it, it just became such an automatic sense of all his students were just like this huge community, right? And uh, I, yes, that very much happens where you, you, you kind of, you know, um, are there for each other. Uh, through the journey. If I could also add one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> so also, I feel, you know, we, and especially, you know, I come from a field of mental health and mental health, I think, um, has been both criticized as well as it needs some critical thinking to say, what does mental health really mean? It's not just about a person feeling good about something, but it needs to connect back with ethics and living with each other in harmony and in peace and with good friendships around us. So I feel the Sangha also becomes such a space to practice that because you see it being practiced around you. So you feel more motivated and inspired as well to come. Absolutely, absolutely. And very, very. Is, um, yeah. You know, 
fab just very very uh, powerful because you stay with what needs to be done you keep coming back to con conduct in your intention yep yeah very well said i think you know uh, you have you see people practice around you and that definitely is a big motivation for us to continue our journey uh, so i'll come back to bikuni vandana for a moment there um were there any moments that you found yourself without a sangha bikuni uh, given that there are challenges uh, in uh, for for bikunis in india and uh, stuff like that i want to hear your personal story and you know how did you overcome those challenges if any uh first of all not on only in india but in the whole world women are facing a lots of challenges like as a lay woman or a ordinary woman it doesn't matter but women have to suffer that's everyone knows because uh, i think women only born for suffering i think so uh, not my personal but uh, i think before two or three days uh, one of my friends she is from vietnam and i think she's uh, she's a ramaneri yeah uh, she ex- uh, she said uh, one day that she's very tense and uh, she couldn't sleep past two days she couldn't sleep so i uh, i asked her why what happened she said that is a one man who is uh, like uh, chasing her chasing her and uh, she uh, he like to uh, like seduce her he was seducing her and uh, she told that thing to her teacher and what her teacher said that leave it Uh, you are telling lies because you don't want to study and so many things she said and uh, she like she didn't support her like if she is your student then you sh- it's your responsibility to take care of her where she will went if something bad happened with her she will come to you now because you uh, you are her teacher so she said like my teacher said something like that that no you are say- you are lying or it's not true etc etc so, so many things she said and she was crying like uh, what should i so, what should i do because she is not supporting me i said uh, listen if you are strong enough to fight yourself then no one can harm you but if you can't stand for yourself then a child can harm you right so you have to fight for yourself first you have to speak that you know i don't want these things i am a nun i already Uh, leave this all these things and i don't want this even in buddha's time this happens with bhikkhunis na so uh, this is uh, in vidas not uh, buddha is not here so in uh, it these things happen in buddha's time so we can't change now we can't change people's mind right like buddha said like everyone not everyone's mind is same he said like in our hands fingers are even not same so we can't just like yes yeah all people who are coming to monastery who are listening to dhamma yes yeah, they have pure heart a uh, pure heart and uh, they have pure mind we can't say it like that right so we we have we should be ready every time that yes we we don't have any one with us we have to fight for us right so i told her that you have to stand for yourself if you can't stand for yourself you can't do you can't learn you can't even learn dhamma because if you will learn dhamma you have to teach by yourself right without experience you can't learn anything i said she said okay i will try i said no you don't have to try you have to do this like because uh, yes uh, with me also this things happen but i stand because i know with if i won't fight then this thing happens with me again and again if i will stand there's no one with that and uh, no one is there who will do this thing same again uh like you said if i feel that there is no sangha with me yes this is that's happened because like you know in india uh, there is a rule for women when uh, constitution was not there in 1956 back uh, that time women don't have rights to educated education to get education right so in our sangha who ordinated in 1998 most of bikunis are uneducated so now i am educated so if i say something good for the sangha yes we should do these changes in our sangha we should start training 
we should not give uh, ordination after 60 or 17 because in india most of people are getting ordination after 50 or 60 so what is benefit in the dhamma like your body is not uh, giving support is not working you should uh, give ordination to young generation because we need dhamma here huh? dhamma need a young people who can work right age people all people can't work and uh, they can't go here and there to spread the dhamma because i'm educated i go around uh, sometimes i go bangalore i go arunachal i go uh, assam right so many places i visit because i'm educated I, and i can speak english and i can learn more languages because i'm educated and i can learn by myself but who ordinated uh, old age they are not educated and they are not ready to learn they are not ready to learn and they are not ready to teach so what should i do if i say no we should teach because in india only in india the 28 buddha was born so india was represent as a buddha's country not as india or not as a hindustan or bharat it represent as a buddha so if buddha sangha was not strong then what will you represent right because of the sangha dharma is still, dharma is still there because of sangha people knows yes these uh, there are the buddha's students there are uh, buddha buddha's daughter or buddha's son right so if buddha's daughter don't have the the learning they don't have education of on the, their own teacher so what will they teach right so because of that uh, they don't like me because i said clearly right because we need that sangha back right uh buddha's dhamma born from india and what we do right we indian monks and nuns go to other countries to learn dhamma is it, it uh, do you think it's a correct right where you born you don't know that language and you need to go to learn that language to other country right it's that thing na so i i told them it it's not correct we should do something for bikuni sangha in all india we have monasteries for monks or nuns but non the bikunis so they they don't uh, take me serious so that time i feel that i'm alone and uh, they are not helping me with this journey to uh, bring that uh, buddha sasana back and that bikuni sangha in the buddha sangha is there so it's a little uh, back thing about uh, indian bikuni sangha <laughs> that's all thank you so much for sharing vandana ji uh, i mean yeah. uh, bikuni vandana it's uh, it's uh, i mean i have not heard this personally before the challenges that you know a bikuni sangha faces in india so venerable dasan yeah, do you want to come in and say like would you relate to some of these challenges of course you know she talked about education or the lack of support and you know um even uh, you know in even uh, bikkhus were not already uh, ready to support the bikkhuni sanghas because of behavior of the bikkhunis were not uneducated and were educated were ready to learn because of uneducated because they are senior na they are not ready to support the juniors like that this right. is things are happening because the bikkhuni sanghas is not growing here in india so would you uh, be able to uh, would you relate to some of these challenges venerable dessel or um, yes i mean because um well you know being in the west it's a similar challenge it's not a buddhist country so people don't really know what this is showing up but because of education and because of his holiness the dalai lama and other tibetan monks and nuns mostly monks but some western nuns who have become more well known in the west especially in the united states people have a little idea they've seen the colors they've seen the haircut and then they're open and they like to say oh excuse me i don't want to bother you but can i ask you are you a buddhist monk and i say well yes i mean none would be better but monks okay and then we talk a little bit but um what bikun even don is saying is um the challenges first are cultural they're twofold the women will definitely have a harder challenge i mean it's changing transforming now in the 21st century because of the education of women that's great more have the opportunity like yourself you're going to be the future leader you know of you'll you'll start your nunnery in india and you'll do that and everything you're saying is true about needing to be young healthy able to learn wanting to learn studying taking that on and then spreading that and then once you get going 
you'll be able to set up programs for those older women at that time who want to come in, who then you can take care of a little bit in that way. But right now you really need to focus on getting some bright light minds that really are motivated by the Dharma to hold it. So it's quality, not quantity, but don't discourage those older ones. Just try to have more compassion, my dear young sister. You know, I, I feel your frustration, but come with that wisdom and the compassion that they have a good motivation. They're looking for something because they're old ladies in India who suffered that life, you know, have that, I have that understanding what that was that they went through. You're very blessed. You have the karma that you've got this mind, this energy, this passion with compassion to, to bring what's needed now a transformation. The Buddha himself said, if you cannot find good traveling companions to practice the Dharma with walk on in practice alone. This Absolutely. means not just as, as our lay sister said, bringing the benefits of the mental health and the stability and the compassion, but also the ethics. So no matter when we're with ourselves, when you're alone, guard your mind, when we are with others, guard your speech. If you have no one to do your monthly confession to do it in front of the, the image of the Buddha, do it genuinely from your heart. Keep everything clean, clear, because in the end, our own future is only dependent on what we do with this body, with this speech and with this mind. That's the most and only thing we can really take responsibility for. But if we do that well, we will be able to create new versions of Sangha. We won't have maybe tons of people wanting to become monastics because for a long time, monasticism was an educational opportunity. The Nalanda tradition of India at one point was the largest university in the world, over 10,000 monks holding the Dharma, debating, spreading the Dharma, and that held in India for some hundreds of years. But even that perished, you know, even that came down because of cultural political battles. And the Buddha saw these things. And when he said, my teachings will last for this amount of time, it shows that even the teachings are subject to the karma of the times, the individual and collective interests, capacities, merits to be able to come through causes and conditions into the robes. You have to have a lot, a lot of sincere dedication and pure dedication, pure motivation to want that. So regardless of who's with us, as long as our own practice is clean and clear, it will magnetize, as Sister said, like those teachers magnetize the causes and conditions, whether they're lay people, whether they're other monastics. Two days ago, I got stuck for a ride. Maine is very rural. It's like being in the Himalayas. I, do, I don't take any car. I took no house. I gave away my farm. I gave everything up to, to really walk the path genuinely. I don't hold any extra kind of, I don't get paid for my, my volunteer position as the spiritual advisor at Bates. I only take the donations. Well, the person who wanted to give me a ride an hour and a half north the other day became sick with COVID. She couldn't bring me. And so I called around. I didn't know anyone in this part of Maine. Some friend who was a few hours away called a friend who she knew nearby where I was, someone I had never met who kindly showed up and drove me, who would not take any gas money. We wore masks in the car. I tested negative. Um, so she was a little bit concerned, but she said, we'll keep the windows down. Uh, the kindness of strangers to show up. Then we know our Dharma practice is good, that that, that bigger sense of Sangha is always out there. Thich Nhat Hanh was wonderfully kind of expansive in this saying, I take the trees, I take the wind, I take the water. This morning there was a deer outside my window. I take it all as my sangha. If we expand it like that, then we can feel, as I said, okay, Aryatara, you're going to work your ways. I have no idea how a ride's going to come, but I'm going to sit here and practice and, and be grateful. I have this day to be alive to practice until the ride comes. And then say to this, this kind stranger, how wonderful to make a new friend. It doesn't matter to me she's Buddhist or not Buddhist. That's She's just a kind human being. And now we exchange some information. She met the Dharma now because she showed up to give this, this vikuni, which means beggar, give her a ride. You know, so we have to be a little bit traditional on the one hand in what the Sangha and bhikkhuni means. And we have to be really creative and evolutionary as the Buddha was on the other to what the Sangha can become.
we can become something amazingly beautiful new kind of lotus garden flourishing that no one's ever seen before and vajrayana were invited to do this you know we use our wisdom and compassion we meet the the conditions yes there's suffering but we're not here to join with suffering we're here to blossom we're here to spread the beauty and power and strength of the dharma thank you so much um, venerable uh, dasel for sharing your story there um i come to uh, nivedita ji right now you know um given your journey so far um how, how do you feel a sangha has helped you in developing generosity and compassion i mean if there you know have there been instances or can you quote some incidents where you 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 learned from your sangha you picked up these uh the six perfections or the 10 virtuous actions or you were motivated to uh, emulate some of your sangha so thanks to your earlier generosity i remembered to unmute myself <laughs> so um there's so much frankly of learning which goes on in all our interactions um i feel this understanding of not just generosity or compassion i feel space and holding and sometimes even being able to receive um you know most of us as lay people we understand we are coming from this illness of busyness you know we're busy people we've got so called important things to do all the time and you just move from one thing to the other and as a result perhaps of this busyness and way of life i feel our relationships are not always very healthy uh, you, i see many people where even core relationships with parents siblings children um not warm not good hearted not uh, happy not meaningful so what happens is there is a certain tightening which happens of the self uh, each time you're meeting what seems like harshness there is tightening and then there's more harshness and there's more tightening and there's more harshness and this i feel just eventually there's this very sense of everything being very solid and not flowing in most spaces but then when you create or have spaces like a sangha which is healthy which is functional which is able to study and push itself or even glimpses of that um i think you can be a little bit softer you don't approach it with the same amount of harshness because in some way these seem like neutral people so you're more willing to give yourself a chance so i feel the space and scope for growth and the space to just start the process of uh softening uh becomes a lot easier and when i say softening in terms of generosity i feel it's so much easier and i speak about this in every class and one of the things i keep hearing back is giving is okay but frankly receiving can be a lot more difficult sometimes because it means you can make yourself vulnerable you can ask for help you're recognizing interdependence you're recognizing you're not some kind of perfect entity who's got it all and you are allowed to ask and be and so i feel the critical element that comes in is a space of allowing for softness and we've all needed help i don't think any of us would have moved even an inch in any of our lovely goals if it was not for the kindness of not just strangers who are holding perhaps technological platforms like this but even every single activity that we have engaged in and being able to see that and share that space um i think uh, increases our capacity for compassion increases our capacity for generosity so practically i think every interaction has helped um when i have kept my mind open enough i wish it was more often though but <laughs> but for now yeah so um you want to add something there venerable uh dasel any particular I do. I do Navidita I think what you say speak is so eloquent and beautifully put because that quickness of life these days of of life just globally now because we can't say it's an east west thing it's just spread itself around the world the the technology's added to it 
um, with a lot of vibrations and stories of fear and uh, everything that the media likes to gravitate to is very sensationalized and very divisive. And that contraction that you speak of away from each other and that solidity is exactly that duality intention I was re referring to earlier that creates a separation, which is the exact opposite of the truth of reality of interdependence, of the oneness of the humanity, the oneness of the life, which is open and flowing and very soft and very interdependent, very moving, very harmonious. And when we have that kind of sense of fear and separation, we distance, right? And that's what creates that tension and pull. That feeling of isolation is actually the real definition of the mental illness, you know? Buddha means awaken to the real reality of the deep, deep selflessness, the oneness. And that's so much intimacy that if people can't embody that within their own experience, if there's no time, to sit with the intimacy of touching your Buddha nature, as well as touching your human nature that still is dealing with a lot of conflict, a lot of ignorance and, and fear, pain. But the Buddha nature once touched can say, well, yes, hello, dear, come on in. Let's have a cup of tea. Let's have a good cry. Let's have some rejoicing. Here's another day to practice. Buddha nature invites it all to come in and to, and to be very vulnerable and intimate. It's fantastic. And there's no critic there judging. There's no one saying, oh, yes, yes, you, you. Oh, but sorry, not you. It's all allowed, you know, and that's the deepest form of, of intimacy and vulnerability and tenderness that each of us could ever generate and allow within our own hearts. Then we can bring in our connections with others, our family members, our friends. These days, it seems in the United States, many people have this only with pets. They don't have it so closely anymore with human to human contact because pets give unconditional love. You know, they, they need you to feed them. <laughs> so it's not really that unconditional. It's pretty conditional from their side, but it feels like it's completely give me the food, wag, wag. Now I'll sit and cuddle with you. There still are causes and conditions, but people miss them. They don't look a little deeper. But the mm -hmm. truth is, Yes, animals are wonderful supports, but human beings even more so because we are each other. We're mirrors for each other. And to be able to invite that vulnerability into our own experience means we're totally that strength that, that Bhikkhuni was talking about. That's a very tender strength. That's a very unshakable strength of the mind. That isn't a resistant strength. That isn't there to a power over or a power to prove anything. It's an embodied sense of knowing one's true essence. And no one can yeah. shake that power. That's the mind unshaken. And that's the heart unbroken. You know, so that's really open heart, open mind. That's how we get there. So we've got yeah. to really keep naming this and, and in, inviting this courage to look at it within our own experience. And then to make it very normal and real and invite our other brothers and sisters who are watching around the world to say, actually, it's fine to feel vulnerable. But don't get lost in fear. Don't get lost in isolation. Don't hide behind a screen. Let yourself be seen. Let yourself be known as one of the nearly 8 billion brothers and sisters here to, to create this next version of amazing transformation on the planet. That's beyond Buddhism even. But bhikkhunis have a big role in leading this because we have this fearless heart. We have this indomitable spirit. And we're sharing that together and saying, come on, everybody has that, you know, yeah. find that for yourself. So Bhikkhuri Vandana, do you have any specific stories from your journey uh, of where uh, a Dharma sister has really, really uh, helped you out as an or egged you on and uh, when you were, uh, your belief was shaken or, you know, and there is somebody who has uh, been there for you? You're on mute, Bikuni. Yes, uh, Venerable Tathaloka Mahateri. She's from USA. So she's like a guardian to me. Yeah? You know, whenever I feel like uh, I don't know anything and what to do, like there's, sometimes there's a situation I don't know what should I do and uh, how to 
express my feeling to anyone and uh, whom to share so i was only she's the only one whenever i need her she's all all time there for me and uh, yeah this is called the sangha right uh, sangha is like a family if uh, one is uh, falling so other one is there to hold the person up yes we are here so that call sangha not by person you can call sangha if there are so many people like trans people then you can yes yeah it's a sangha so not in india because you know i am a young person i born in 21st century so my thoughts were different from the people who were born in born in 90s or like so it's sometimes it's hard to explain what i uh, want to do Oops. Oops, we lost Bikuni there, but I think while she gets back uh, on her network connection, um, I'll <clears throat> come back to you, Venerable Dessel, for the moment and um, try to explain. I know uh, Bikuni alluded to it a little bit earlier. Not everybody uh, in the Sangha, uh, you know, comes with a pure heart and a pure mind, right? So uh, let's explore the contrary is there a sense of competition sometimes in a sangha like you know who knows more i mean from my own personal experience i've seen two sisters two lay uh, i mean i'm talking about lay practitioners um the two sisters were both practicing the same um uh, tradition of buddhism and uh, it got so competitive in the family that uh, you know who has the one up manship who 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 is practicing it better right uh, does that something is that something that happens uh, in your sanghas as well is there a sense of competition or uh, does it prompt the ego to surface well yeah look i mean the song is made up of human beings whether you're a monastic or whether you're a lay woman uh, or a lay per, uh, you know lay man you're a human being first and so until we attain our full buddhahood we are going to be dealing with that ego that's the whole purpose of the dharma right is to cleanse us of of those difficulties and so of course when you're in a more intensive community like the sangha that everyone's really trying to come in and and find you know purification a more higher truth a better way to be more effective human being whether you're in a monastic role or a lay role you're still dealing with your human being mind and the ego is still there i mean we should we don't kid ourselves about that so within the nunneries the ego can emerge of course even more intensively because we're all saying yeah we want to do this and we're going to push this hard to, to, to follow the path and practice. And so, of course, you can expect during retreats or during conversations or just during daily life that that ego is going to get challenged. That's the point of, of part of the point of the song is to help point out where you're still caught in, in the prison of looking for something, where the ego is still looking for some kind of external gratification or internal sense of superiority. Or, or betterment. And so those are actually good moments for everyone to practice. So in a sense, it's the opposite of the external world saying, um, you get a reward if you show the strongest ego. The reward in the sangha is when the ego shows up, you get to defeat it. You get to work against it by seeing it and, and finding out what's the antidote. So if you're blind to something, you really need others as a mirror to show you that blind spot. If you think that you're going to practice alone all the way up to enlightenment, you're kidding yourself because there is one Buddha that attained enlightenment. And even he was practicing leaving his family, leaving his marriage, leaving his responsibility to his father who wanted him to be a king, practicing with different teachers of his time. He was always practicing it with others, you know, and that's how he attained. So we're never going to do that in isolation. And by, by being interested in the Dharma and participating in Sangha, whether as a lay person or a monastic, we're actually 
showing that willingness to look into the mirror to go, ah, oh, yeah, look, I forgot that spot. You know, I thought this side looked so beautiful and clean, clear, but look at that. You know, so that's what we're supposed to be doing through our practice of Dharma together. Where that can fall down is if there is competition amongst individual practitioners, like you mentioned of these lay sisters or within traditions of lineages within like Vajrayana, we have practiced Rime, so we value all the different traditions within Gelukpa, Kagyupa, uh, Nyingmapa, Sakyapa. Everyone's got precious teachings that are valid that will lead all the way to the goal. We value also Mahayana practices. We value Theravada practices. There can be a healthy kind of debate and competition where you want to, that's how we use debate within Vajrayana is to go up against arguments to try to hone our understanding. And there you're invited to kind of crush your opponent through debate, but you're not crushing any person. You're just crushing a, a faulty way of thinking. This is really important. And unless we get rid of that ego that takes things personally, we're always going to be walking around with the wounded suffering of the ignorant mind, you know? So we need to be feeling grateful to others to help us understand where our practice can become even more clean, clear, where our sense of humor can become even more light and joyful, as Jetsuma likes to say, the seventh perfection, sense of humor. You know, we've got to be able to take it seriously, to listen to what we can do better, to improve, to continue to use our practice as a sandpaper, to soften the mind. But we can also use the sense of humor of getting the view that's so clean, clear of the true way things are to just be able to laugh at ourselves and laugh with life. You know, it's both. It's, it's, we, we, if it gets angry, if it gets into a sense of argumentation through anger, then the egos are just completely combusting, you know, and hopefully if it's a true practitioner, they can take time away and go, okay, that was good. What can I learn from that? And sometimes right. people aren't there and it really turns into anger and really into feuding. Well, then you need that. That's how the Sangha breaks up. And that's why the Buddha named dividing the Sangha is one of the great non-virtuous activities. That mm -hmm. if you divide the Sangha, you get thrown out because that is not the role. The Sangha can hold differences and it can hold judgments, but it cannot hold division. You know, so... Like when, when the Buddha ordained Angulimala, who had been this black magician who was trained in a bad way by a sorcerer to cut off thumbs. And if he was going to get a thousand thumbs and kill a thousand people, he'd become all powerful. When the Buddha met him in a village, he didn't run away. And Angulimala was like, you know, why can't I reach you? Why do you keep running away? And the Buddha said, I'm not moving anywhere, but you really can't approach to where I am. And then Angulimala was shocked because no one had not been afraid of him. And he said, oh, you must be said, you must be the Buddha. I've heard about you. And then the Buddha gave him teachings. Angulimala immediately renounced his bad, non-virtuous life and asked to become ordained as a Sangha. And the Buddha said, yes, of course, I'll ordain you. That created some discussion among the bhikkhus who said, what is he doing? Like this guy is a murderer. But the Buddha said, look, even the murderers got Buddha nature. And until they want to renounce their murderous ways, until they renounce their ignorance, how will they ever begin to set foot on the path? So this is within the Dharma practice. We can see the Buddha's own wisdom of how he valued Sangha to then be able to be the vessel for anyone who wanted to begin the journey to enlightenment. So we have to be able to know that there may be things that don't sit right with us sometimes, that then we have to really think deeply, contemplate, ask other Sangha members, ask our teachers, how am I seeing this? Or how would I come to see this in the Dharma view and not just through my own ignorant view of ego judgment that would say good, bad, and just quickly dismiss. You know, we need that time to really try to look at the different perspectives and Sangha gives us excellent opportunities for that. Thank you. Thank you, Tasella, for <clears throat> elaborating on that. We have a lot of audience questions coming in. So we'll go with the first question to uh, Nivedita ji. Uh, how should we take care of mental health and psychological well-being among the female Sangha, both lay and ordained nuns? How can both sides be well supported by their male pra practitioners as well? 
<laughs> yes, slow but steady. <laughs> so, um, what a lovely question. Thank you, Juan. Um, I feel also in some way, of course, uh, that Venerable Dasella was answering it in terms of, you know, when we say lay practitioners, female practitioners, male practitioners, these are also, I feel, boundaries in our cognitive mind, which becomes really strong and starts saying me or us, and then there's obviously a them. And I feel um, that creates its own set of tensions. And um, then we want, it almost feels like then we're making more solutions for problems which are originating from these divisions to begin with. Um, sometimes, of course, I feel they become necessary because there's no other way to work around it. And if that's the way it is, in which case first step would also be to really start, uh, you know, what His Holiness says, going from the me to the we. We want to see everyone as really someone, a sentient being who is having their own share of suffering. We may or may not see it. It may not be visible, but it doesn't mean it's not there. And we want to be able to bridge that gap. And one of the most um, perhaps powerful ways of bridging that gap becomes, of course, through communities like this. But in the absence of that, it can just be through communication. And one of the aspects of communication uh, is that, you know, it means being present. It means I'm not approaching this conversation with someone else with a whole lot of, but they should speak like this, they should be like this, they should look a certain way, but really being able to drop a lot of those ideas that we're carrying in our minds and hearts, which get us to be more close so that we're able to better understand from their perspective. And, you know, it's as simple as saying um, the way I see it um, and being able to start from there and being able to listen and also stay present to all that rises because what arises is something that our minds have been trained in. And so in that conversation, actually, you're learning two things. One is you're learning about the opposite perspective, but the second is also you're learning how your mind responds to that. And if you are able to apply principles of um, mind training, uh, you are able to engage more openly, you are able to engage with an open heart, you're able to hold on to intentions and aspirations um, much more than uh, picking up or getting aggrieved about things which arise. The second part about mental health, I feel, and this becomes a little, I think it runs across the board, is we need to start looking at mental health perhaps a little more expansively. There are multiple schools of thought within mental health, and many schools of thought talk about building a sense of self. And I feel it's, now this is a little tricky, so I'm going to try and be articulate. <laughs> it's um, important to have a sense of self, but not as um, tightly perhaps as we think so, because it's not then as accurate. At the same time, one doesn't want to deconstruct it for many kinds of people because it doesn't become helpful either. Um, and there needs to be a sense of understanding that you have power and capacity to reflect and work and be an agent of change. At the same time, perhaps, the way you have seen yourself is not completely accurate and therefore perhaps limited and therefore perhaps actions that emerge from that assumption are going to be misguided. And you want to slowly start working through with that as well. So it doesn't mean dropping of confidence, perhaps as much as dropping of the ego and pride, which comes up from a sense of this is who I am. And I feel if we're all able to move in that direction, uh, it eases up with conversations, it eases up with mental health, because also it means we are holding spaces for each other. So we are not only going to a Sangha as much as co-creating it wherever we are, with whoever we are, as much as possible. And that becomes our own um, growth and path as well. Very beautifully said, uh, Niveta Dadi. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a lot of audience questions still waiting, so I'll really jump on quickly to the next. I'll take um, 
question uh, from Nivedita Hastak. Uh, Venerable Dasel, if you want to take a stab at this, what would you say about a Sangha that includes people who are not followers of Buddha Dharma? Do you expand your Sangha to uh, practices beyond Buddha Dharma? What is your take on that? Um, yeah, I mean, as I said at the beginning, I myself was not born into a Buddhist family. And so I met my Buddha teach, Buddhist teacher um, and I wasn't calling myself a Buddhist, but when I was going to the teachings he was offering, he was clearly offering them as part of the Buddhist community that within that community is called the Sangha. So the men, women and children who follow the teachings of the Buddha, whether they're in robes or as lay people, who are following the teachings of the Buddha are the Sangha, but that's always open to newcomers who, who have no idea about Buddhism. Now we can't expand the term Sangha to just anybody because it's a very specific technical term used within language and within Buddhism in particular to talk about the followers of the teachings of the Buddha. But of course, it's always open to people who, who know nothing about Buddha Dharma, who are looking for something. Most people, in fact, these days come to Buddhism as not being born in Buddhist families. And so at the beginning, not having taken refuge, not knowing what that even means, I mean, many people, most in fact, I think these days come as not followers of Buddha Dharma, but in fact, in some point, decide to take refuge. And by taking refuge, by taking a, a very formal kind of ordination, not, not ordination, but commitment, a commitment of taking refuge in the three jewels. You take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. You go for refuge. So it's an act. No one's forcing you to do it. And you understand what that means by going for refuge. Buddha is the teacher. Dharma is the teaching. And the Sangha, in this case, is really like the community, especially the monks and nuns, who uphold those teachings and keep them living and sharing actively in the world, not as their own ideas, but as the teachings of the Buddha. And so then there are also lay people involved in that part of the Sangha as well, who are learning the teachings, some who become ex excellent teachers themselves, who then can offer it. So yes, I mean, people who are not followers of Buddha Dharma at the beginning can show interest only because there is a Sangha really, because if there's no Sangha, there's no way to, we, we're not alive when the Buddha was there teaching, and then there would be no one sharing Dharma. So I think if you understand that it's open for everybody, and even sometimes we have people who come to our retreats who aren't going to follow Buddha Dharma, but they're very respectful of it and they want to learn from it. They follow their own tradition of Hinduism or of Christianity or Judaism, they can definitely benefit from learning from Buddha Dharma, but they wouldn't necessarily then be called part of the Buddhist Sangha. The Buddhist Sangha are people who are really following the teachings of the Buddha, who have made a commitment to follow them and who are who are going for refuge by practicing them and upholding them. They understand they're studying them. But of course, when we have big retreats, when we have online talks like this, we, we're not just trying to talk to Buddhists, we're just trying to share the beauty of Buddha Dharma by holding a very committed community that's following it. And that community is called the Sangha. Thank you so much for highlighting that. Uh, I think the common purpose is what defines probably, you know, articulates the, uh, the <clears throat> role of a Sangha. Hmm. I'd come to uh, the next question um, to Venerable um, Bhikkhuni uh, Vantana. What would you say is the difference between an online Sangha and an actual Sangha? Because given the pandemic, it opened up avenues for all of these online interactions. And somehow, you know, people across the world bonded and created these virtual groups for themselves. So do you really see a difference uh, between the two? Yeah, there are lots of differences uh, when we say that uh, practical and theoretical is a very different, right? So when we observe something, like when we practice something and we uh, feel something, it's very different. Like when you read something and you do that thing, it's a very different. Right? If you read, you will remember for a short time. But when you experience that thing, you will be remembered for that long. Right? Uh, like lifetime, you will remember that thing. 
so when you will when we do online things like we only see that person and yes what he wanted to see but uh, at that time uh, online we can't observe so many things but we interact personally so we can feel the environment the vibes when the sangha was there when the uh, if uh, if you've been in a sangha you you can feel that vibes that good vibes when you are surrounded by sangha when they are giving teachings the whole atmosphere was so peaceful but that thing you can't feel here right yes you will feel uh, some uh, in a small amount but not in that exact amount when you are surrounded by sangha because um, you can't uh, feel that person right and uh, you can't see exact uh, the feel uh, you can't feel that uh, what they are wanted to say and it's it's a very different thing like if you are imagining that i want to go there uh, if you like some place and you yes imagining that yes i want to go there and you will see that pictures it's a very different thing but when you went there so you will enjoy that thing right from your heart and you will experience that thing but when you see that thing on the uh, picture so you can't explain that beauty and uh, that every small details of that place but when you visit it you can explain every single details of that place what uh, what did you do there and how you feel there you can explain everything yes online is thing when it's like a uh, uh when uh, we can't go outside and we don't have any thing that uh, we can do so that because of that we came to online but i should suggest that uh, actual sangha is a uh, very important than online because uh, actual sangha is very rare to find right because uh, you can find one monk one nun at at sometimes but uh, it's very hard to find a uh, sangha a whole sangha because every time they will go here and there they were spreading the dhamma in whole world so when you see the actual sangha your heart will be very pure and the pure emotions will come from your heart but when you see in online you will say okay it's like a movie or it's like a something but when you see when you feel it the pure emotions it will come to your heart your mind will be peaceful and your mind will go towards to the sangha that yes what they will telling i should listen yes like that so i think actual sangha is more important than online yeah? everything is uh, important but i think actual sangha is most important thing thank you so much i think it does bring in some more <clears throat> you know the personal experience and the the the, the, the experience of being with them is definitely yeah. much more motivating if you're physically with them um we have another question from a teenager and i'll direct that to nivedita ji i'm a teenager and haven't been able to find too many like minded people in my age group who are enthusiastic about discussing dharma how does this absence of a peer group affect my practice what would you how would you suggest one can overcome this thank you for the question sanya and uh... i appreciate the fact that you've been able to engage with this at this early age i think it's incredibly precious um so one of the things that i would definitely recommend is i don't know enough about you or if what if you're following a teacher uh, or if there is or where you're based i think it would be helpful to find a teacher because it would be helpful to understand your situation in a little bit more detail to kind of make something more specific uh and within that space i feel what can definitely be done in the interim is to cultivate our lovely lovely parameter of patience <laughs> you know because um like what venerable dasala was sharing earlier that it's not always easy and um while we aspire and want and many times when we are learning something there's a certain eagerness to want to share and build um and sometimes that can actually influence adversely even our friends close to it because if they don't understand it or are not on the same page which can lead to a sense of alienation and isolation so first would be to really start perhaps studying a little bit more to engage with the teacher more actively 
to also make sure that a lot of other uh, practices, uh, you're trying to bring in these practices into some of your daily life, which means how you approach, whether it's, you know, accessing, entering a bus before you reach college or um, how you are when you're in a store to start being able to be, bring in some of these practices into your daily life, which includes also having compassion towards those who are not um, perhaps following the path or having an interest so that you're able to start meeting them where they are. Um, and then as you engage with the teacher more deeply, perhaps uh, some of these issues will start getting resolved as you start connecting with a Sangha, which is in that space, perhaps uh, there will be more scope for meeting people your age. But all the very best, and I rejoice in the fact that you will have so many more years of practice than many people like me. And yeah. I just want I just want to add to that because some groups now online are really focusing to teenagers. So you might look into Mingu or Rinpoche's group, Tergar.org. Mm -hmm. There are specific groups and organizations around teenagers, as well as INEB, the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, has a young person's um, branch, and they're really there for teenagers. And I just want to add to you that I rejoice also that you have this great interest. And despite the difficulty in finding others like-minded of your age, you can always approach older practitioners and teachers, and they will value that you have this interest. And keep your ethics really pure for yourself. Don't get caught by your peer groups. I wish someone had really pushed me harder when I was your age. I came to it myself after some, you know, experiments that I needed to make. But if someone had said, no, no, the way you're thinking is really good. Just keep going with that. It really does make a difference um, not to do certain. I mean, I knew certain things that I wouldn't do. But here in the United States, like so, so many, you know, opportunities for mischievousness arise. And wherever you're based, just stay living clean, clear. And, and as Sister said, follow the teachings put them into practice, but also look online for some some engaged Buddhist uh, communities that are focusing on teenagers because they are sprouting up here in in West in New England, USA. There are even retreats now during the summertime for high school and college age students only to come together at Buddhist centers to do um, the Pasana Shamatha retreats. So, you know, this is the kind of thing we want to create more worldwide opportunities for. So thank you. Wanted to just thank you, Dosella. Thank you, Dosella, for chiming in. Um, I leave the last question. I think uh, Bikuri Vandana had spoken some time back about you know uh, some challenges that they faced in the sangha itself. So here's a question that talks about victims of religious scandals are normally females. So are there any ongoing projects in Buddhism to help heal them? If not, why? And if yes, how can we help enhance it? I would like, you know, comments from all three panelists on this and, you know, from Niveda Taji on getting a mental health perspective as well. And, you know, from the two monastics as well on the panel. So, Venerable, uh, I mean, Bikuni, if you want to take your first stab at this. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a very good question. And... Uh... I like that uh, people are uh, recognizing the bikunis and uh, the nuns. So yes, uh, in India, I started my organization named uh, uh, Buddha Kaya Educational and Charitable Trust, especially for women uh, and especially for bikunis who are uh, educating uh, and we are helping them in their education uh, and everything. Like uh, uh, there is no place to, for them to stay and uh, there are no is uh, no one is ready to support them so that's why because i am young and i i faced all the difficulties and all the challenges so i know uh, it's very hard to uh, live in uh, india as a nun so uh, i that's why i started my own organization and my uh, call is to uh, create a great bikuni sangha in india and future and yes if you wanted to help uh then uh, you can help like uh, i request all bikunis from all over the world that uh, they can give uh, teachings to our uh, young bikunis that and uh, guide them because here uh, we need 
teachers so who can guide us from their hearts because we don't have a really a uh, teacher like you can i said before that they are not educated uh but they guide us sometimes they guide us but uh, what we need in is the more important is education so i just need uh, i i just request so all the uh, bikunis from all over the countries and communities please uh, recognize indian bikunis uh, because they are trying to come up in the dhamma and they are trying to bring up the sangha in india but we need support from all over the countries not only for india because in india it's a really uh, it's a india is a religious country and people are trying to destroy the buddha's dharma so it's very hard for us to survive here because they are not accepting a uh, woman to uh, as a uh, live as monastic life so yes uh, you can help us uh, every time if you need we can uh, tell you yes you can help Yeah, thank you. If you can give the name of the organization, uh, Bikuni, once again. Uh, Buddha Kaya Educational and Charitable Trust. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. Venerable Dasel, you want to uh, take a stab at this next? Um, I would just say that when these difficulties come up, that the anyone involved needs to reach out and speak very clearly for the need for help and support so whether it's a bikuni or a nun or a lay person that um you know being direct about your experience and and really reaching out and looking for that support that's needed is so critical um and not sitting on something for a long time and letting it fester and then build up some months down the road or years down the road but being direct and exact in the moment that's needed to try to you know think as a in our practice like a bodhisattva that if there's a difficulty that needs to be changed take the responsibility to make a wise and compassionate informed step to change it so that others won't be affected adversely the way you yourself had gone through so part of what we're doing is a change maker as a bikuni or as a as a getsel or um ordained or lay person is if there are difficulties that need that are not clean clear that are non virtuous that need to become transformed we take that responsibility to become that change agent to name it to work for that transformation but to do it through wisdom and compassion to do it through dharmic virtuous ways of right speech not infused with anger not infused with taking a role of division of sangha but of as as a process of purifying and cleansing the the practice of dharma so that it remains as a clean clear practice for the benefit of all mother sentient beings i think we have to be careful not to get too caught up in concepts of um perpetrator and victim but we have to look at how does the greatest good come about we can get really lost in that division of political discussions and trying to take one side as the responsible side and the other ones as the victims that's not really going to help anyone out towards the highest goal of the promise of the buddha dharma which is really full enlightenment and awakening for the benefit of all mother beings so take action with skillful means and methods find the right speech and find the first the transformative motivation pure motivation to apply the buddha dharma which means taking some time to think about that and then reach out for some allies and then be very direct thinking about well this is for the benefit then of keeping the dharma as a valid practice in the world so we should do that very skillfully very maturely um with a sense of purpose and a sense of commitment but not with any anger not with any dualistic division not with any mistaken views then you know and this helps us practice the dharma better because we do need language we do need to name things sometimes but as the buddha said i use concepts but i'm not confused by them yep thank you so much uh, nivedita ji would you want to add anything from a mental health perspective of uh, yes um so couple of things you know one is um, thank you for that question and i think uh, bikuni vandana was also referring to it earlier um i feel most of the time when there are issues like this many times it stems as a sense of uh, it the solution appears to be to address those who are 
victimized alone. But I think also we should perhaps start having a slightly broader perspective on causes and conditions also that lead to situations like this, which means that we need to start looking at what becomes intervention. And it can be perhaps about understanding. It can be about wondering where objectification of women perhaps comes from. It can be about looking at media. It can be about looking at lack of empathy, which is perhaps becoming more um, prevalent or being able to push for one's own needs, impulses, and so on. And I feel we need to broaden that understanding in order to actually actively engage. Uh, because, you know, we're otherwise also supporting a culture which is saying this is more, this is less, this is different, and so on. And I think these divisions become, uh, frankly, at the root of why certain groups get treated certain ways. So, in addition to only looking at victims and saying help is needed, perhaps we need to have a broader take. And, you know, connecting this back with what Sanya spoke about and where Dasala was sharing about organizations working, I think working with youth becomes critical. So a lot of programs like, for example, His Holiness a Sea Learning Program, where you are looking at building on other forms of intelligences, being able to bring in ethics, being able to connect with your emotions, finding healthier ways to coexist on a planet which is otherwise quite honestly burning um, becomes important you know so we need to be able to work together and really see all of us not only as part of the solution but also as part of the problem so in some ways approaching it with a certain amount of humility as well as authenticity to say what can i do which means not only uh, in my interventions or projects, but also in my daily life, in my conversations, in my ways of engagement with um, people around me, what kind of language, respect, other aspects do I bring in? Um, and I feel that helps not only prevent issues like this, but also overall leads to a healthier society, perhaps. Thank you so much for those wise words, um, Nivedita ji. Uh, what a wonderful conversation this has been highlighting, not just the importance of the Sangha, the problems, challenges, and um, also providing us guidance on the way forward. Um, Nivedita ji's mental health perspective really added value to uh, some of these questions. So uh, with that, I think, you know, I would like to thank all the panelists today for your very valuable um, comments and uh, hope we can interact again in the future, um, maybe on the same or maybe on a different topic. And uh, so thank you all once again. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I just add one comment? There's a there's a nun who's watching from Israel and her chat and her phone's not working, but she wanted to just add this comment. This dialogue among the women from different Buddhist traditions together gives me immense joy. I want to share that one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And that's the intent of us, you know, coming together, building um, a, a supportive Sangha and egging each other on on our individual journeys, motivating each other along the way. Thank you so much. And yeah. uh, with that, I welcome Samiksha back. Okay. I don't think so. It's just her who is rejoicing in this beautiful dialogues. It's many of us. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would really thank you. Thanks to each and everyone, for, especially to Sister Smita for bringing up new topics, new and interesting topics, addressing some very important questions. So uh, that was really very beautiful. And to all our contributors, thank you for sharing your wisdom and enlightening us. Thank you, Nivedita, Sister Nivedita. Thank you. Thank you. Venerable Dasil and uh, Vikuni Vandana, thank you so much. We uh, really hope to see you on our next program as well. So, so I think before we close this session, we have some announcement of upcoming events. Okay, we will be having uh, the part two of War, Peace and Dharma Practice, which is a part of Mindful Politics series, uh, which will be held on 26th of June, which is Sunday. Our participants will be uh, Dr. Oleg, uh, Vivek Sharma, and Evigenin. Uh, and the program will be moderate, moderated by 
Sharab Wong. So please do join us on this series as well. And I think this is the only announcement we have. Okay. So before we conclude this session with the four great powers, I would like to invite every one of you to uh, please, uh, please have a small dedication prayer from your respective traditions. So first of all, I would uh, like to invite Venerable Tenzin Dasella. Kangri wa we korwe shin kam dir pandam de wa malu chang wene. Genere si wan tenzin yatsoi. Shape si te bardu ten gyur chi. Jang chup sam chok rinpo che. Ma ke panam ke gyur chi. Ke par nyam par me par nyam. Gone gone du pel war shok. In English, that sounds like in that snow mountain encircled land, source of every benefit and joy. May Lord Tenzing Gyatso Chenrezi remain in life until samsara ends. Precious Bodhi mind, may it arise where it has not arisen and where it has arisen, may it flourish and grow forevermore. Bhavatu Sabha Mangalang Rakhantu Sabha Devata Sabha Buddha No Bhavena Sabha Dhamma No Bhavena Sabha Sangha no Bhavena Sada Sati Bhavantate This is me. Oh, sorry, sorry. This is me. I, yeah, thank you. Uh, I dedicate the merit of today's um, conversation and all our dharma activities thus gathered towards the realization of all the deeds and the prayers of all the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas of the three times and to the upholding of the doctrine of scripture and insight. May I in all lives, through the force of this merit, never separate from the four wheels of the Mahayana vehicle and accomplish all the stages of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, perfect view, and the two stages. From my two collections, vast space that I have amassed, from working with effort at this practice for a great length of time, may I become the chief leading Buddha for all those whose minds, wisdom, eyes, blinded by ignorance. Thank you. Sister Nivedita. Borrow words from Venerable Scholar Shanti Deva in the guide from the dedication chapter of the Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. And I'll say two paragraphs from here. For as long as space endures, and for as long as living beings remain, until then may I too abide to dispel the misery of the world. I prostrate to Manju Ghosha, through whose kindness wholesome minds ensue, and I prostrate to my spiritual masters through whose kindness I develop. Thank you, everyone. One and a half billion people sad, didn't sad, have sad. access to clean cooking fuels or clean heating fuels. Those okay. are the problems in the developing world. Where is this sound coming from? OK. So let me recite this four great powers. Sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. May all beings be well, happy, and safe. Once again, thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to our audience for joining us. But thank even you. in countries as recently thank turning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for participating. And thank you to Sao for organizing. China. We see the difficulty. Thank you once again. Thank, thank you for inviting us. It's yes. a wonderful yes. conversation yes. with all of you. Thank yes. you, thank Sister you. Nevedita. Yeah. Thank you, Samita. Thank you, Vendable Dasal. My pleasure. Thank you, Samiksha. Love to see you again. Love to see everybody. Yeah. yeah.